This is an oral history interview with Roe R. Cross Professor Dr. Kevin Ramis. It is taking place in the Donald Reichert Center for Publishing and Literary Arts in Plum Hall, room 304, on August 1st, 2018. The interviewer is Amy Sage Webb. This interview is part of the Roe R. Cross Professor's Oral History Series organized by Emporia State University's Special Collections and Archives. Hi, I'm Kevin Rabus, and I'm going to do a little bit of jazz poetry to start out with. Jazz is one of my passions, and also in terms of my art, it's something that inspires and feeds what I do. I'm going to do a poem called Bird's Horn, and it's about Charlie Yardbird Parker, who was a Bach genius, so he played the fast version of jazz. He's from Kansas, cut his teeth in Kansas City, lived from 1920 to 1955. This is a poem in the voice of a fellow saxophonist, so it's in the voice of another jazz saxophonist who lent his horn to Charlie Parker. Charlie Parker would sometimes show up to a gig without a horn because he was in a horrible uh, auto accident going to and from the Ozarks, and during that he busted up his spine really well, really bad, and the, um, the doctors prescribed heroin, which he never got off. Uh, so sometimes he'd, he'd pawn his horn on the way to a gig and someone would loan him one. So this is called Bird's Horn about uh, 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 some, some uh, in the voice of someone who's a fellow jazz saxophone, uh, saxophone, saxophone player. Bird's Horn. Nights in light I lent in my horn, afternoons I wrapped my hands around the horn, bird blew. This was not unusual, bird was often without a horn. He'd blow into town, and everyone would offer him one. He'd play anything, played a plastic saxophone specially made, just above the level of a toy in Toronto, I'm told. They kept it, piece of plastic, played once, full of only his spit. I didn't learn a thing from him, except to keep my hands on my horn, keep my hands on my horn, keep my hands on my horn, whatever horn I had. Okay. Thanks for talking with me today. I'm excited to be able to interview you uh, for the Road Cross series. Um, anyone meeting you at this point in your career with, what is it, 11 books now? Um, is it 13? Uh, it, it, it's nine and will soon be ten. <laughs> <laughs> ten books. Uh, and how many plays have you had produced? Nineteen? Something like that. Somewhere right. between, yeah. Right. Uh, I've, I've looked at your curriculum vita. It's about 24 pages long. Um, <laughs> so at this considerable list of accomplishments, anyone uh, meeting you now, uh, Row Cross professor this year, and of course, Poet Laureate of Kansas you are standing on the tip of an iceberg of a lifetime worth of effort and accomplishment. And what I hope to get at a little bit today is some of what's underneath the surface. Mm -hmm. The award-winning poet, playwright, short story writer is here with us. But some of the process that goes into you being that person is what I think might be of interest to people watching this video. Uh, so I'd like to start by asking you to talk a little bit about the practice of being an artist. Right. For me, it's very much a daily thing. I do um, spend time writing each day and following my uh, research and passion interests. One of them is jazz. We just heard a little bit about that. Right. Um, I, I conducted interviews. I read. I listened. I went out to clubs to find out the things for that one poem. It took mm -hmm. um, probably a month of research if you were to add it all up for maybe 60 words or so. Um, and so part of that process is uh, pleasurable to me. I love going out and doing that sort of work. Um, when I volunteered at the American Jazz Museum, I made my pilgrimage to Bird's saxophone over my lunch hour every day. And so I went and looked at it and thought about, what can I write about this particular horn? And it makes a cameo in there. So daily writing um, is one of my things when it comes to that. It doesn't always have to turn out as a poem, but I like to get something down each day. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I fall back and write to a friend of mine, Dennis Etzel, who's a poet in Topeka, 
and if I, if I don't find the writing coming, I'll talk to him about what I'm trying to write about, and then include a poem that came along with that to my friend, who doesn't really judge things, but instead encourages and uh, roots me on, and I do the same thing for him. So being a part of that process, and also observation is a big deal. How do you look at things? Or do you have the right perspective, like psychologically, um, socially, um, morally, whatever that means, etc. How do you look at the thing and decide what is it? What's my relationship to it? What are other people's relationships to it? Um, a lot of uh, folks talk about this analogy of uh, windows and mirrors. Mm -hmm. um, you, if you see something and it's like yeah. you, um, it's a mirror and you're looking at yourself and learning more deeply who you are. And then if it's a window, um, it's not like you and you're learning about things that are different from you. And so I have been um, grappling with that metaphor for some time, um, not knowing what to call it. Hmm. No discoveries yet. Yeah, well, I mean, I, 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 I'm learning things. I'm just yeah. not done, you know. Um, I think part of the deal is I do like lifeline, lifetime learning, lifelong mm -hmm. learning. Um, there's a saying that you may learn the melody and chords of a jazz tune, but you will not know that tune um, your whole life. You will, you will work on it your whole life mm -hmm. trying to master it and mastery may be just an ideal when what you really need to do is enjoy learning more about it. It's almost like learning more about a person. You know, if you're, if you're in love with someone, you try to learn everything about them, or at least most people do, mm -hmm. and you will never know everything. You, mm -hmm. you can't. Um, you know, there's that D.H. Lawrence story, uh, Odor of Chrysanthemums, where um, the, the wife character says, I didn't really know my husband as well as uh, uh, I would like, but our time is done. He's dead now, and um, uh, I won't, there are a lot of things I won't learn. That's the way with all of us and our friends or whoever right, else. You know. Right. This, this idea of, of peers, you've brought this up. Um, Dennis Edsel, the poet uh, who's living in Topeka, is your daily correspondent, yes, mm -hmm. um, and the tradition of epistle writers engaging on the page with each other is something we've largely lost. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? And the concept of letters to a young poet arises out of that as well, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Both Rilke and your project. Yes. Right. You know, I find myself being a little more honest and a little more free when I'm writing on paper. And so I like that process of writing, being able to scratch out, write around things, you know, a computer is a little bit linear. You write and then you have to delete or, or you know, move the cursor around, which is aggravating. And so I like to be able to draw and, right. and write and cross out. Um, this is one of the only times I've ever talked to you that you don't have a notebook in front of you. That must yeah. seem strange. Well, I do, um, <laughs> I do have a, a page. Uh, she, she, so, um, <laughs> um, I can give you a marker. Yeah, that's okay. I got a pencil yeah. here, pen okay. here somewhere. Um, right. But um, um, I, I like the process. I like mm -hmm. writing to my friend. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're both in poetry. We're in the po biz. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a joy talking to somebody about our lives and also what we want to do at, as poets. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. I lost part of that question, though. Um, Letters to a young poet. Right. Well, you know, Rilke, the Austrian slash German poet, um, wrote back and forth to, they called it a younger poet, but the poet wasn't really that young. I believe that he was in his 30s or so. And he was asking advice, and the younger poet's um, questions remain. Rilke's, no, Rilke's uh, answers remain, but the younger poet's mm -hmm. questions are not, are not cataloged, which is sad. So I thought it would be neat if Kansas poets would mentor younger or more inexperienced poets, and we would get snatches of that conversation. Uh, recorded so others can learn and so also it would be archival um, and so that's a project I'm working on right now of, of launching I've been working really hard on making the call for that um, um, as good as I could so that people would know what to do um, so that's something I'm doing as poet laureate of our state and it's about ready to launch I've got a pretty good draft of the letter and um, I'm looking forward to what happens that's fascinating yeah the famous quote from Rilke that every writer struggles with yes. is the phrase, you must change your life. Yes, yes. What has that meant to you? Yeah, and I'll throw in, since we've got a local version of that, 
um, you know, there's also the William Stafford, you must revise your life, right. which is us riffing <laughs> off of Rilke, too. Right. Um, you know, I was thinking about this. Uh, one way of talking about that is if when I got better at writing in exponentially or in terms of, you know, made quick progress for fast, one of the things I went back to is how do I talk? And then can I talk on paper? Mm -hmm. And then um, try to capture the way that I really think or say things out loud. Because sometimes we think in images and of course you, mm -hmm. can't, you can't write that. Um, but then I thought, now if I want to get better, whatever that means, in writing and improve, um, I may have to find a new way of talking. I may have to change the way that I interact mm -hmm. with the language. And so in some ways, revising the way you speak, the way you think, then will start to make incremental um, progress in your writing. And then as you progress as kind of a human, um, that, that revision will come in come up in the writing too. Does that make a mm -hmm. kind of sense? It does, absolutely. Um, your mother was a journalist, yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Was that a beginning point for you in this path? Certainly. My mother was my first teacher, inspiration, advocate. Mm -hmm. um, she worked as a reporter for the Shawnee Journal Herald and then worked as a reporter and then editor for The mm -hmm. Sun. The Sun was the kind of number two um, paper in Kansas City after the Star during her time. Um, she encouraged me to write, and she was a model of writing. She wrote daily and was often published daily, too. At one point, she had a column, which was pretty cool, where it was a kind of talk about town uh, thing, and she would interview her friends and sometimes change their names and grapple with things that they had going on in their lives. And it was a little bit like the Gus Welp column, or in, in town, the flyover people, mm -hmm. Cheryl Unruh col column. Um, she would, I've told this story before, uh, take me along on, on interviews, and so she would take the shoulder strap from her tape recorder, fling it over my head, and have me walk behind her with a microphone as she interviewed people at fires and city, um, city events. Um, and so that showed me that telling stories, um, um, Telling other people's stories and finding out what the story is is important to our community, you know, the village, our our group of people. Mm -hmm. The community of people we we build around us. You've mentioned several ways that happens just now, um, and you've been enormously contributive to poetry culture, arts culture in Emporia in our state. I know it's part of how you go about teaching and mentoring students. Do you want to talk about that, about how we build and sustain communities? You've mentioned right. a little bit why they're important. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's really important to have people that care about what you're doing and to have you care about those people in your community that are doing art. You know, in some ways, artists are the folks who keep the arts going, as are their audiences and, and supporters. Um, I was part of a group that, uh, of a fan, founding member of a group of Emporia writers that used to meet at Java Cat Coffee House mm -hmm. with Tracy Million Simmons and Cheryl Unruh and others. And I had to bring along my young, at, the, at some point, toddler son to those meetings so that I could attend. Um, and so he would play checkers or Jenga blocks mm -hmm. while we talked about what we wanted as writers, what were our goals, what were our aspirations, what are we up to, and later that group grew and we have, a, I think, a fairly large group of writers for a town of our size, partly because um, some of us gathered together and said, come be part of us. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was just lucky to hit town at the right time to be a part of that and to have met Tracy and then lady, later Cheryl to um, to do that, um, um, I also think we should support artists of all sorts. Like I try to go to as many art openings as I can, uh, musical performances in town. I go to almost every play the ESU puts on, um, and I learn from those things. I grow as a as a person, but I also am showing support and being a part of things. And so you don't have to be an artist to do this. You just have to show up. How do you foster that in your students that you've mentioned lifelong learning, curiosity, right. engagement, 
How do right. we foster that? Right. Part of it is like the carrot of passion. You know, I, um, like I love plays, whether I'll get more than two written a year, I don't know, but uh, I love going to them. And so the first thing is to get engaged and love something artistically. And we have a good theater program, especially for a place our size. So I love going to those plays. And so I foster that love by going to as many as I can. So find that pa passion and follow it. Um, is one of the things. And then enjoy being among people who who inspire you in some way. You know, um, almost all the times I've made discoveries in my art, I've experienced someone else doing it on paper or in person, and I thought, oh, that's an opportunity. That's something else mm -hmm. I could try out. Like the drums and poetry thing. Um, one that comes quickly to mind is, is I saw a folk singer playing drums while he was singing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'd never seen that before. Usually it's a guitar that they have. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd also heard of the beats, of course, but none of the beats I knew were playing brushes or a drum. Mm -hmm. You know, they may be playing bongos, but um, not, not the snare drum. And so it became a combination of those things, the folk festival and Kerouac and Baraka, mm -hmm. and, and, and there it comes. You do jazz poetry and you also do poetry plus funk. Right, um, right. Collaborating with students and other mm -hmm. artists um, and even some kind of folky uh, music too. Mm -hmm. How did you develop that range of performance? Right. You know, for me it really started with this 1958 uh, recording, Weary Blues, where Langston Hughes um, collaborated with Charles Mingus and made a jazz poetry album. There are a few jazz poetry albums before that and there's many after it. But that's really the starting point for the good stuff in many ways. Um, I used to listen to that when I was shelving in an archive. Um, I was always at the archive listening, and one, one time the guy who was running at Czech Haddix said, Kevin, you're always here. Why don't you clock in and shelve while you're listening? And so uh, that, uh, that, that became that. So that, that recording really started for me. And then I went and learned a lot more. Now you can Google it and quickly get to it, but mm -hmm. back, back then you had to go to the LPs to start learning and read the liner notes, etc. That's great. Are there other memorable experiences that you can point to in your education and, and your path as an artist? Right. You know, something that keeps coming back to me is jam sessions, mm -hmm. where you as a younger musician would sit in with the older, more experienced musicians and learn something. You might learn something you're doing well, but often you'd also learn things you need to work on and go home and they would call it woodshed, work out things that are that you need to work on. Um, and so, jam jam session culture became a, a, a teacher to me. I mean, I would go to six to eight jams a week. I was mm -hmm. always out. Um, and one thing is, you might get a job from those. That would be the 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 gym. But um, the other thing is you would just have community and you'd learn things in, on the stand, in front of other people. And as a kind of shy person, um, that taught me a whole lot. You know, mm. When you mess up in front of your heroes and your friends, um, you learn pretty quickly. Hmm. Interesting. What advice do you find yourself giving to uh, young writers today? Who come to you and I know a lot of them do right right I think I would find people slash artists that you like and learn a lot about them you know find the thing that really does it for you and follow that but then soon after that also start exploring mm -hmm. the people in their lineage the people before them and after them but also all sorts of other things too mm -hmm. so find things you like and then expand your repertoire so for instance in music and jazz music, I might like John Coltrane, but that also means I need to go a little bit further back to Charlie Parker, who hired him, mm -hmm. and then I need to go back a little further from that um, 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 to who hired Charlie Parker first, and it, it goes on in that in that way. Hmm. Why did you choose to teach at ESU? You know, this is a weird answer, but. I had been to jazz camp here as a middle schooler, <laughs> and uh, I, 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 reminded, it was, I was reminded of how cool and fun that was. Mm -hmm. So I had been here two summers, um, and 
and so I knew a little bit about the place. The more serious answer is I really wanted to teach and learn in Kansas. I wanted to stay in my home state. And I've almost lived all of my life in Kansas, and so I wanted to be here. Also, it's the kind of size of school that I felt I would be at home at, meaning uh, teaching would be the first thing, and I would, I would have the freedom and time to teach well and grow as a teacher. Mm -hmm. How did you find that language arts were going to be your thing? Because music was very much your thing, too. Right, right. How did you find that as your passion and the path of your, your artistic and scholarly life? Right. You know, I did get some encouragement early on in a, as a middle schooler or a high schooler. I did have some things that placed in contests and, mm -hmm. and mentors who um, encouraged me. Of course, I had my mom rooting me on as well. <laughs> um, Music was also something, but I, find my, I found myself doing both for a long time, and some of the things that I could not express through music, I could through writing. Mm -hmm. And so I found a larger palette for me in writing. Now, there are some things that I don't get out of writing that I can express in the same way, and so I still drum. Mm -hmm. You are a very encouraging mentor to a lot of young writers yourself. Um, it's clear that that had a role for you and that you, you passed that along. Um, what are some of the challenges for young writers, young artists? Um, one that keeps coming up for me is competition culture, mm -hmm. uh, the voice, um, mm -hmm. um, that sort of show where we're competing against each other. Now, some might say that's a little bit like a jam session, but at a jam session, you have mentors, older mu experienced mu musicians who are on the stand with you, mm -hmm. not just backstage coaching you before, and they could fail too, and sometimes <laughs> do. And, and you could even help them out on the stand. Right. It doesn't happen all the time, but um, one time Speedy Huggins uh, was, playing, uh, uh, was playing a gig, and he was a little bit older, and he sang, you don't get around much anymore in the first set, and then he sang it again in the third set. He'd forgotten that he sang it before. And so, um, uh, you know, a person, a younger person could make a joke and say, I love that the first time too. You know, so you can save each other and joke about things. Um, whereas something like The Voice, probably the, the mentors are backstage and they don't mm -hmm. fail or succeed with you on stage together. Um, and I don't think, I mean, I was thinking about how um, you don't have to be um, the best American poet to enjoy poetry. Not that I am that, but let, let's say, um, let's say, let's say, in baseball. I was at a baseball game the other day. I'm not an expert on that, but you know, I don't have to be the Mike Mustafas of of hitting a baseball. I could be somebody who is good on my own softball team and once in a while hit a hit a double and. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I might actually enjoy that more than being Mike Mustafas. Mm -hmm. Interesting. What you're describing leads a little bit into pedagogy and, and how we teach creative writing and what creates an environment in which student creativity thrives, in which students engage in, in more rigorous research about their art, developing their craft. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that and, and your process? during your time at Emporia State, how you've learned from teaching, what you've learned about teaching. Right, right. You know, they, you've heard, we all know the adage that um, if you really want to know something, try teaching it, and then you'll find what you know. And that, that comes up for me all the time. Um, and sometimes it's also, how do you prepare something for the group of people that you're working with today in the classroom so they get it in a way that works at their level and their interests and passions. Um, so I pay particular attention to what examples I bring in so that we find a clean and easy path to the first grapplings with materials and then maybe bring in some things that are a little bit wilder or more experimental when it comes to that particular lesson. Um, but 
part of it is finding where are people and how can you speak to them, and then how can you teach the things so they have the fundamentals, and then move on from there. Um, I think I think that's one of the main things that's changed for me in my teaching that, and to have a plan A, B, C, and D uh, when it comes to the day's lesson. Um, you know, I have a long syllabus because I have essentially a, a rough version of my class plan on each day. But we, we veer from that based on what people are, are getting in the moment. And they may get more than, than I had anticipated. I'm like, okay, now we need to move to the next level. Um, you know, in music, it's like knowing score, knowing scales and how those scales then turn into chords and how those chords interact with the melody, etc. So one day I might come in with scales and they're ready for the chords, so we gotta move up right away or they will be bored. Um, so that's, that's one thing. You know, a good example of this on paper is Kim Adenizio's book, Ordinary Genius, where she essentially mm -hmm. takes her writing exercises of the days for herself and gives that to other people. Mm -hmm. And not that I'll ever do that, but that's, I'm in that vein. Um, and she was one of my mentors, but um, it's just maybe synchronicity that we're both um, learning in that same way. There may be a bunch of us that learn in that way, um, but that's a good paper example of, of what I'm grappling with. You're the same type of writer, the yes. practice writer, the daily practice, uh, yes. and also the, the uh, background in music, Kim Adonisio brings that as well. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. Other mentors you can think of who were extremely instrumental for you? Yeah. Tom Thomas slash Tom Lux was very instrumental to, to me. You know, I have that little story. He came to my town. I took him out for jazz. I'd gotten into his school, but I couldn't pay for the tuition. Um, and he said, can you catch? And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> he said, I have a softball team. If you can ca play catcher on that while you're up there, I'll let you in free to my summer writing workshop. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot from him about lineation, um, about sound hmm. and image, um, about telling a story that is not necessarily about you. Many people have noted that Tom, Tom Lux sometimes has a book that has the letter I um, only like seven times, mm -hmm. um, whereas many would have like 50 times. Not that um, I'm always following that, but when he talks about others, the way he approaches that is something that I really learned from him. Also here, how he approaches history, telling a historic story, like the bird's horn uh, mm -hmm. example would be a good one. Um, I learned a whole lot from him, and he was a kind person uh, mm -hmm. to me. He also brought people together. He brought two German students uh, to the session I went to in the summer. So he flew them in from Germany. Mm -hmm. And so we got to talk about German poetry. Um, and um, you know, in Germany, the idea of a poet is very different. They believe you're born a genius and you develop, but um, there's no school for creative writing in mm -hmm. Germany, at least there wasn't at the time. Mm -hmm. That's something we hear a lot in, in creative writing and other arts, too, that an artist is born rather than made, that it is inspiration versus perspiration. We tend to hear a lot of binaries. Where do you locate yourself in that conversation? I think I'm made in perspiration for the most part. Um, I think I did. Ordinary genius. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I probably inherited some things from my mom when it comes to um, grappling with language, but I worked at it, and drumming too did not come naturally. I, I could groove as a young person, but learning um, rudiments, lear learning um, um, ear training, things like that, it took a lot of work for me. Um, I, for instance, I kind of w talked my way into a higher level uh, music um, history class, and I was not very good at identifying the, the patterns of music that they were going to ask me to be tested over. And so I would go into the library pretty much every day and hand transcribe the pieces of music that they were going to test mm -hmm. me on so, could I, so it just became a multiple choice for me instead of a, an identification, um, meaning pick out each note. I just wrote it until I had it, and then I would just rewrite it on the page. And so 
that's a little bit weird. Um, <laughs> but uh, that was how that I did it. Sounds like a good survival skill. Yeah, for yeah, yeah. And so that was certainly perspiration. Um, I, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Who are some models, writers you admire right now, whose work you're following, um, who are doing something that you're, you're interested in exploring? Right. That changes almost like once a month for me in some of this stuff. I mean, I have ones that I'm always following, but um, I'm going to butcher this, but I'll do it first so I don't, so I don't, so I don't feel pressure. Um, Amy Nezahukamato, or Amy Nez, is an inspiration for me right now. She's a, a young writer, um, deals with imagery in a way I'm fascinated with, deals with the natural world, especially animals in a way that I find fascinating. One of her parents is, one of her parents was a biologist. Um, in a strange way of connection, she is married to a guy I used to play basketball against, um, and so I can I have like access to talk to her through him, which is really pretty neat. And he's a good writer too, um, so I'm fascinated with her work. Also, voice and story that her way of approaching the confessional is interesting to me, um, and she does that through childhood experiences and also the experiences with the natural world. Uh, both things that I I, I really. Uh, like um, Kevin Young, Topekan, who has risen, um, uh, head of the Schoenberg Center for uh, Black Culture in Harlem, as well as the poetry editor for The New Yorker right now, teaches at Emory, etc. Um, he grapples with jazz in a way that I really admire. Um, he's kind of, you know, his, his generation's top jazz poet in many ways, um, in a certain way. Now, he doesn't really perform it, but you know what I'm saying. Um, 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 Kay Ryan, I'm studying right now, former U.S. Poet Laureate, especially for how she has these slender lines that are like two to four uh, words a line, how she um, turns things using uh, sound, and also how she has this quirky vision, mm -hmm. um, the, the lesson or moral or statement in her poems is really interesting, almost in a uh, Emily Dickinson way, like mm -hmm. you get to the end and like, wow, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> um, um, and then um, those are a few. I mean, I'm also studying Creeley when it comes to these slender lines, mm -hmm. a little bit of Lynn Lifshin, um, et cetera. Kevin Young, back to that, many of his poems look that way. Um, those are a few. I mean, and then there are, there are regional folks, like I'm way into Tracy Brimhall's work, mm -hmm. who teaches yeah. at K-State, et cetera. She's amazing. Um, let's talk a little bit about your upcoming projects and how some of what you're doing might manifest in your teaching here as well. Right. Um, well, there are going to be some exercises on these uh, poems that are just a few words a line. Uh, it's something I'm studying, and a lot of students have been writing in that shape, and so I'm interested in where did you get this idea? Why are you following it? What do you want to do with it? What are the uh, advantages of this? What are the challenges, et cetera? Um, combining music and poetry is uh, something. We do a little bit in the, each of my classes, but we may do um, some different exercises that are coming to me as time goes on. Um, using dialogue is something I'm thinking about a lot lately. How do you, you catch the rhythms of a person's speech? How do you cut out a lot? Like that bird's horn poem, I cut out so much and inserted so much that it's no longer really the people that were saying it. It's coming from me trying to say the things that they may have wanted to say or the things that would serve the poem. Um, Which starts to lead maybe into playwright work mm -hmm, mm -hmm, again. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, and I love listening to people talk. Mm -hmm. um, you may have noticed that I don't like to talk as much as I like to listen to people. Um, and because they, they say such brilliant things and they just pass on and go to the next thing. And part of my job, I feel like, is to mine some of that stuff, take it and put it into something. Um, and it also, you know, when, when I realize something because somebody's saying something, um, then, then I feel like I want to do something with that. Now, I may not, you know, maybe one out of five times does it come to something, but. Um, Somebody may say just the right thing. That's kind of the way that, you know, Cohen's and 
and a teacher who sits there and listens to your works or, or they say something and then you're supposed to take some grain from that. Mm -hmm. So it, it can be mystical, transcendent, etc. You created the short play festival here at Emporia mm -hmm. State where students are doing script in hand readings. Some of that forum that you admire about in improvisation, practice, groups of people getting together, performing, mm -hmm. uh, that's been tremendous. Uh, are there other things you can point to that are legacies that you hope will continue that you've begun here? Right. Well, the first Fridays have been at Ellen Plum City Bookstore or something. I love that community of people. And it's a different group than our student mm -hmm. um, gathering of folks. And I think people really enjoy that. It helps them get through the week. Um, <laughs> uh, the month. Yeah, okay. the month. <laughs> right. Um, how do you hope to be remembered right. as, a, as a mentor, as a teacher, as an artist? You know, I haven't... Is that a moribund thought? That's it's okay. <laughs> I mean, I haven't really thought about that in a concrete way. I mean, I've thought about it in a kind of like a, here's what it might sound like, you know, way. But um, I would like to re be remembered as somebody that inspired a bunch of other people to do what they want to do. Like, follow your dream and write. Not that you have to do it full time, but um, help push you into a level of it becomes fun. For instance, my wife plays guitar, but she doesn't really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, and I wish um, she could get to the place where picking up the guitar is fun. And when I sit down to play, the first five minutes are fun, and then we get down to things I don't want to do. Um, so, uh, but that fun part is like, all right, I can do this. This is fun. I, I remember this. And sometimes the things that I wasn't able to do come easily because mm -hmm. I'm in the right mindset, something's going right, you know, whatever. But I would like people to enjoy writing poetry, enjoy writing plays, you know, whatever it happens to be. Um, it is hard work, but that, that, that you know, the, the buzzword now is flow. You're into the flow or the energy or the lightning or electricity. I'd like people to, to link up to that more of the time. Are you talking about Mihaly Sikhsek Mihaly's concept of flow, creativity? Yes, yeah, uh -huh. yes, that, that thing. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. There's a whole science of creativity now, which yes. seems paradoxical, doesn't it? Yes, yes, uh -huh. yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. And it doesn't mean you have to create something great by any kind of technical standards. Just enjoy doing it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Bob Dylan has a horrible singing voice, <laughs> but he enjoys doing it, you know, and we enjoy it with him. <laughs> This is true. Neil Young, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, once you become a Row Cross professor, they hang a photo of you in Plum Hall that yes. is there for perpetuity. Uh, and as your photo goes up on the wall, I think they did it this week, didn't they? They took the picture yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> as that photo goes up uh, and you think about yourself contributing to this long tradition of the, the Cross Professoriate, uh, what do you hope your contribution will be to that? esteemed group. Right. And you know, I spent a lot of time looking at those photos. Like <laughs> maybe two times a week I go and look at them. They're outside of the door to where I would meet Lisa for lunch. And so I could I, I would look at them and think, you know, how do these props uh, represent what these folks did? Like yours has this great long winding uh, row of books that you have learned from and love and appreciate, mm -hmm. including your own book. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you were among those folks who were friends and mentors and led to this, you know, legacy we're all a part of. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, we once had, Le my wife Lisa and I used to have these uh, kind of like pet names that we had taken from um, an artist exhibit and there were like new names for people. And mine was, uh, there were two, last to get angry and handles lightning. And when it comes to <laughs> handles lightning, I'd like to be somebody that gives other uh -huh. folks that spark, that mm -hmm. current, and uh, in all things they do. Like, um, for instance, Rich Sleezer kind of was wanting to write poetry, and we started writing poems together. Right. I would the like associate that. dean of liberal arts and sciences. Yes, uh -huh. yes. I would like people to, to feel like 
I was a helpful conduit to things they love to do. Mm -hmm. uh, my students, my peers, my anybody I interact with. And so that's, I'd like to be remembered in that way. You know, that's what we're supposed to do with our students, I think, but also it shouldn't stop there. Like if you're a poetry person, um, it's useful to say, hey, we can all do this. Mm -hmm. um, we are coming upon an hour and I wanna make sure that I've given you opportunity to talk about anything you would wanna talk about. Is there anything else that you would wanna to add to this interview? Yeah, I think one thing is to nurture the arts around you. You know, we should nurture the arts around us because um, sadly enough, the arts are under attack as a nation here. The funding is being stripped away from them at the national and the, the local, regional, state uh, uh, level. And so one thing we can do as, as people, artists and non-artists, is to support the arts in some way. So somebody's having a, a art opening, their paintings are up on the wall, go and look at it, and if something speaks to you and you have the cash to do it, buy it so that person can buy some new paint and paint something else. We were in Russell and I saw you buy a painting. <laughs> so uh, that person gets to make another painting because they've got the paint to do the next thing. Um, and you don't, like I said, you don't have to be an artist to do that. You just have to show up. You know, every time you go to a play, those artists are getting paid, the actors are getting paid, this crew is getting paid, etc. Um, so go and be a part of things. And you may not always, you know, like or agree with what, with what you see. That's part of the process. That's the window, learning what others have to say. Um, and, you know, I, I see it equally important if I go to something that, that makes me think in new ways as something that affirms something I already saw. I mean, I really prefer to learn something, but um, both of them are good. Um, so I'd say go out and support the arts in some way, whether you're an artist or not. And part of me thinks we're all artists. We all do something that's artistic. Like um, I have a sister-in-law who doesn't think she has an artistic bone in her body, but you know, she writes a birthday letter to each of her relatives every year. So everybody gets a birthday card with some writing in it that's an art. Um, um, and if we were to take and add all those up, meaning the thousands of birthday cards, when, when her time is done, uh, she has left a legacy. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you for taking part in this interview. It's always fun to talk with you and to hear you talk about art. Yeah. Uh, and thanks for being part of this. Thanks. My pleasure. <laughs>